No more sickness, no more cancer, no more diabetes, no more high blood pressure. Yeah, yeah. How I made it, how I made it, I'm gonna put on my robe. Yeah, yeah. And tell the story how I made it. I'm gonna be able to 
to talk to my daddy, my granddaddy, big mama, auntie. Yeah, yeah, soon as. Hallelujah. Soon as I get. Oh, come on, let's worship God. Jesus for making a way for us. Thank you for your saving grace. I ain't always been like this Lord, but you brought us from danger seen and unseen soon as God, we just thank you this evening for being God. We thank you for making a way out of no way. We thank you for your healing. We thank you for your deliverance. We thank you for your anointing. Soon as Thank you, Jesus, for your anointing, for your deliverance, for your may-making power. If it had not been for the Lord on my side, where would I be? I believe it was David that said, I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praises shall continue. Oh, my goodness. Praise the Lord. Let the church say amen. 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 One day I'm going to see his face. One day I'm going to wear a crown. Huh? One day, one day, one day I'm going to put on my robe and I'm going to tell the story. How I did what? How I made it over. Let's pray. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege it is to carry everything everything to God in prayer. Eternal God, our Father, we come now in the blessed name of Jesus. And Lord, as we come, we come with hearts of thanksgiving. We come with hearts of praise. We say thank you, Lord, for your goodness and thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your tender, loving kindness. Thank you for right here. Thank you for right now. Lord, you didn't have to do it, but we say thank you. Thank you for allowing us to come now and assemble in your name to worship you in spirit and in truth because you are worthy to be praised from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. You are worthy. You are Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. You are the great I am. And Lord, we have come to worship you. Lord, as we come now, we come with full understanding that without you, we can do nothing but with you all things become possible. So Lord, we come now asking that you just feel this place with your presence, your power, your peace. And Lord, speak now to your people, for we, your servants, are listening. Lord, forgive us of our sins, forgive us of our shortcomings, forgive us of the wrongs that we've done. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy on us. And Lord, forgive us for failing to do what we know we should have done. Lord, help us, help us to be more and more like you. And Lord, as we come now, we thank you for the Sixth Avenue Baptist Church. We thank you for the pastor, associate pastor, and all of the staff. And Lord, we pray your blessings upon them. And Lord, we pray for Dr. Watson as he shall come and declare your holy word. Do now, Lord, what only you can do, because you are able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond anything that we can even imagine, think, or ask for, 
according to your Holy Spirit that works in and through us. So Lord, right now, right now, whatever the situation, whatever the concern, we pray that you address every fear, every doubt, every anxiety, every situation, and Lord, let your people know that even now, even now, you're right there with them. Lord, do now what only you can do. Lord, somebody here needs peace. Somebody here needs strength. Somebody needs an encouraging word. Lord, bless us now. And Lord, we just pray that all that we say and all that we do will be pleasing in your sight. And Lord, may the words of our mouths, the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Lord, bless your people. Bless this pastor. And bless the man that shall come and declare your word. And may you receive the glory and the honor. For it is in Christ Jesus' name that we pray. Let us all say, Amen. 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 If you have your Bibles, would you turn to me to Isaiah? Chapter 39. We're well, actually chapter 40. I'm just going to do one verse. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. It reads, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint the word of God for the people of God. Bow with me. Eternal God, our Father, again we come with heads bowed and hearts humble. We come to say thank you. Your loving kindness, your gentle and tender mercy. Where in this world all is vanity. Lord, we come asking you now to bless each and every individual here and the homes they represent, the people they love and the people who love them. We know that you are our all in all. We present ourselves tonight for your service. We pray that you receive our gifts, whatever may come. We pray you receive us as we endeavor to do your work and your will. Now, Lord, we realize that we are living in times where men push their way to power. They bully their way to friendships. We know that it's in you that we live and move and have a being. Now bless this offering, we pray, in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.
Praise the Lord. Put your hands together. He reigns forever. Oh, yes, one day every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. Oh. 
shouted amen take your neighbor by the hand if you would on the left and on the right just for a moment and let's pray for each other Lord for the neighbor whose hand I hold I thank you and I give you praise that you have assigned goodness and mercy to follow them all the days of their lives I thank you for allowing my neighbor to live to see another day, for bringing them through whatever they had to come through. And I squeeze their hand now just to let them know that I'm in agreement, that the worst is now behind them, and the best is yet to come. So bless my neighbor, strengthen my neighbor, comfort my neighbor, and I will give you praise in the name of Jesus. And everybody shouted, amen. Now put those hands together and give God a praise. And we give all praise, glory, and honor to God from whom all blessings flow. We give praise to God for the Lord Jesus Christ, whose name is above every name. In fact, so amazing is he that at the mention of his name, every knee must bow and every tongue must confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. To this inimitable, incredible, innovative, and invocative pastor, preacher, prophet, me celebrate him and give praise to God for him. Amen. To all the pastors and preachers and leaders who are assembled here who share with this pastor the tremendous task of telling the world that the cross is still vacant and the tomb is still empty. <laughs> to the official family of six Baptists who partner in expanding the kingdom of God and who have learned how to build arcs where there is no rain and walk by faith when you could not walk by sight. <laughs> to all of those who have led us in worship tonight and all of you God's children gathered in this place, good evening. It's good to be here, and I want to uh, pause gratefully here and thank your pastor and all of the staff and official family of this church for this kind and coveted invitation that's mine to come and for the first time have the opportunity to share revival with you. I was trying to think of some big words to express my excitement and I thought of two, I'm elephant excited and hippopotamus happy <laughs> to be here tonight celebrating with you. It's a joy to be in Birmingham, Alabama. And I need your help tonight, so do me a favor and set the atmosphere on your row. I just want you to look at your neighbor on the left and right and give them a great big smile. Show them your 32, your 22, your 12. Your two, whatever you're still working with, just smile at them because it's good to be alive. It's good to be alive. I tell people all the time that the greatest gift we receive from God on a daily basis is when you wake up in the morning. That nothing else has to happen. If you wake up, you are already blessed. So we thank God for blessing us today. And there's a word from the Lord that we'd like to share with you tonight found in the Old Testament book of Joshua. Joshua chapter 4. I want to read in your hearing verses 21 and 22. And then I want to tag this text. Don't forget to remember. 
The text says in Joshua 4, 21 and 22, he said to the Israelites, in the future, when your children ask their parents, what do these stones mean? Tell them Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. Look at somebody and say, don't forget to remember, eh? You know, for a book about conquest, if you're familiar with it, Joshua surely skims on all the military details. What weapons did Joshua's army use? How many officers and battalions did Joshua's army have? How many men made up each platoon and division? Did Joshua have an elite Delta fighting force? And if so, what type of training did he require? The answer to these and so many other questions we don't know, and frankly, candidly, we don't know because the emphasis in this narrative is not on the physical battle, but on the spiritual one. The real conflict of the Israelites was not with the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Gergesites, the Amorites, or even the Shilites, but it... (laughs) Yes, somebody got it, somebody didn't, amen. But it was with Satan and his demons. Canaan was the choicest real estate on earth. It connected Africa with Europe. It accessed the Mediterranean Sea. It was marked by fertile fields and lush valleys. But most importantly, the land in scripture was designated as God's gift to the people of Israel. Nearly seven centuries earlier, God had promised Abram in Genesis 12, 7, to your descendants, I will give this land. God set this property apart for his people and set his people apart to be a blessing to the world. God promised Abram, I will make you a great nation. I will make your name great. I will bless you and you shall be a blessing. This amalgamated assortment of bad lands, better would become the couriers of God's covenant to a galaxy of people around the globe. This promised land would be the parchment upon which God's redemption story would be written. Think about it. The city of Jerusalem, the town of Bethlehem, the sacrifices of the temple, the prophecies of the prophets would all unfold on this land. The Redeemer would be born here, grow here, walk here, live his life here. He would soak this dirt with his blood and shake this ground with his resurrection. Direction. And so the book of Joshua isn't about claiming real estate for a dislocated nation. It is ultimately about preserving a stage for God's redemptive drama. And Satan's counter strategy was clear, contaminate the promised land and corrupt the promised child, destroy God's people and dismantle God's work. So Joshua's battle then was a spiritual one. And can I suggest to you on this opening night, so is ours. If you believe it, tap somebody and say, I know that's right, amen. See, our fight, I remind you, is not against flesh and blood, but it's against powers and principalities and the rulers of spiritual wickedness in high places. And that's why every day God blesses you to wake up. Before you put your feet on the floor, you need to put on the whole armor of God. That's Ephesians 6.12 where Paul says, then on the day of evil you will be able to stand strong and when you have finished the whole fight, you will still be standing. Now I recognize my friends that in our current contemporary cultural moment that the idea of evil, whether abstract or incarnate, strikes most of us as antiquated, old fashioned, odd and outdated. The popular trend in our day is to blame all of our problems on genetics, governments, the environment, and your mama now. <laughs> Yet the Bible presents a very real and present foe to our faith and our future, and the scriptures go further to personify and name this presence as Satan. He rebelled, he disobeyed, he fell, and he wants you and I to do the same thing. But the devil is a liar. 
And whenever you begin to have an affinity for lies, you know the devil has your ear. That's frankly been my challenge with the current administration at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue since the very beginning that by any observation they have a discrepant relationship with the truth. I know it's our first time, but can I have a minute? Because our country is in a crisis of morality, and that is not an alternative fact, and nor is it fake news. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. once said that vanity asks, is it popular? Politics asks, will it work? But morality and faith must always ask, is it right? Is it right for millions of children to go to bed hungry every night in the U.S. while we give tax cuts to billionaires? Is it right that the elderly and sick among us die because health care is inaccessible and medication is unaffordable as companies put profits in front of people? Is it right to monetize incarceration such that there's no focus on rehabilitation in the situation, only the frustration of lifelong limitation for those who are trapped in the system? Is it right for us to encourage little white children to set up lemonade stands and applaud them for being enterprising, but when a little black girl sells water in front of her own house, barbecue Becky call 911 like she's a threat to the public safety. Is it right for a sitting president of the U.S. to enfranchise dictators and autocrats around the globe and solicit the assistance of foreign governments to help him politically bruise his opponents? Is it right to create a fictional national emergency around the southern border? Remember that? When gun violence is a very real national emergency that has been completely ignored. Is it right for the president to be filmed on video berating Hispanic Americans about their accent and chiding that they need to learn how to speak English when all of us know that the first lady sitting up in the White House can barely put a whole sentence together. Now, I know you didn't come to hear this. You waiting for me to get to, ain't he all right? And I'm going to get there, but, but I just want to know, is it right? The devil is a liar, and any person who has dared to draw near to God has felt the enemy's attack. And that's at least one reason why all of us can celebrate tonight, because despite the attacks of the enemy, your presence here says you have survived. You ought to smile at your neighbor and say, I am a survivor. Amen. You have dared to think about and talk about and step towards God's fortuitous future for your life, to walk in faith and not in fear, to lean on grace and not live in guilt, to hear God's voice more and listen to the enemy's voice less. You have survived. But before you get too carried away, can I remind you that the enemy still has you in his gun sights, that you are on the enemy's hit list, but don't trip. You may be on his hit list, but you still on Jesus' mailing list, and as long as you on his mailing list, everything will be all right. For the first time in nearly five centuries, Hebrews were camping in Canaan. This was the moment that they had been waiting for. This was the hour that they had dreamt about. How many times that they gazed across the Jordan at this lush land. Some of them, like Joshua and Caleb, old timers, had been waiting for a long time. And somebody on your road tonight knows what it is to hold on to a promise from God for a long time time. And therefore, when God opened the waters of the Jordan River, they didn't have to be prompted twice. Joshua 4.13 reports that all told about 40,000 armed soldiers crossed over before God to the plains of Jericho ready for battle. They hurried across with a holler and a hoop and a clap sounding a lot like Drake. It's a lot of bad things they've been wishing on me. God's plan, oh y'all know that song, I'm sorry. <laughs> But had not, had not God stopped them, they would have run straight into Jericho. But God did stop them because God wanted to prepare them. 
and God is preparing you right now for what is yet ahead of you. I know I talk fast, maybe I should slow it down to 33 so that you can definitely get it, that God wanted to give them one more word. And I'm remembering now my mother, gone on to glory, five foot one, who brought into this world 17 children when she sent us to school every day on the first day each year. Her message was exactly the same. With our lunchbox full, our breakfast now eaten, our jackets and our school supplies now in tow, all of us would be excited to get out of the door. And she would stop us all on the front porch. And after a while, we knew what was coming. The sermon was the same. She would get us on eye level and say, remember what I taught you. Remember who you are. Remember whose you are. You are Watson and you bet not embarrass this family. See, and that's exactly what God does right here. God brought their impending invasion to a halt, and by virtue of a few commands, he prepared them for what he had ahead of them. If you read the text, he says, stack 12 stones taken from the bed of the river, and in the future, I want you to tell your kids the story of how God brought you, as Dr. Miles Jerome Jones used to say, through wet places on dry ground. Can I hang out there for a minute? Because I think this text teaches us tonight the secret of moving ahead, the secret of surviving in hostile territory. And the first lesson that it offers to us is this, that if you're going to make it, if you're going to live strong in this next year, despite whatever comes against you, it's going to require you to remember what God has already done. If you don't mind, help me preach. Look at your neighbor and say, remember, amen. See, that's why we have gathered tonight to mark this moment of winter revival, to record again God's accomplishments in our memoirs, to capture this particular crossing in our memory. Before you look forward to Jericho, you always have to look backward to Jordan and remember what God has already accomplished there. At least you ought to be as consistent as faith Facebook. I know I lost about 25% of y'all now, but at least you ought to be as consistent as Facebook. Those of you who are on Facebook know that Facebook has a feature that they have been displaying for the last seven or eight years where they will go back without your permission into your postings and pull up pictures, pull up texts, pull up experiences and quotes that you may have shared two, four, six years years ago and they will remind you of what you were thinking, what you were doing, what you were saying at the time. And that's the minimum that all of us ought to do in our relationship with Almighty God. Come here, somewhere in your archives, you should have some snapshots, some text messages, some posts, and some reminders of what God has already done in your life. And periodically, like in revival, you ought to pull them up, remember, rejoice, and give God praise. Okay, that didn't get you like I wanted it to, so let me try and help you. Some years ago, Pastor, I was driving my daughter to school, and she noticed on that short ride that I wasn't talking like I normally do, and she said, Dad, why are you so quiet? I told her I was worried about some deadlines that I had to meet, and so she inquired, have you ever had any deadlines before? I said, yes. She said, how many? I said, I don't know, hundreds, maybe thousands. She said, have you ever missed any of them? I said, not for the most part. She said, so let me get this right. In the past, God has helped you to meet hundreds, maybe thousands of deadlines. Then she looked at me looking like her mama and said, don't you think he can help you one more time? Can I translate? She was saying, stack some stones, Dad, because hear me tonight, Satan has no recourse to your testimony. Your best weapon against the attacks of the enemy is a good memory. 
don't forget a single blessing. Remember God forgives all your sin, that God heals all your disease. God redeems your life. God saves your life. God keeps your life. God sustains your life. God protects your life. God crowns you with love, mercy, and joy unspeakable. God wraps you in goodness and covers you in mercy. God renews your youth like the eagle. God has brought you all the way, kept you every day. God restores your joy, sustains your peace. God makes everything come out right, work out right, end up right. Won't he do it? See, see, I like how Psalm 103 verse 6 puts it. It says he puts victims back up on their feet. You ought to create a trophy room in your heart. And every time God gives you a victory, put a memory up on your shelf. Before you face your next challenge, your next crisis, your next contest, take a quick tour of all of God's accomplishments. Think about all the paychecks he provided, all the blessings he has given, all the prayers he has answered, all the sickness he has healed, all the burdens he has lifted, all the ways he has made, all the doors he has opened, all the battles he has fought, all the wrongs he has righted, all the problems he has solved, all the victories he's given and give him praise for what he's already done. I'm sorry, I should have told you, tell your neighbor, say, neighbor, I don't normally do this, but I'm going to be loud tonight, amen. This, this revival, see, and you ought to imitate David. Before David fought Goliath, he remembered how God had already helped him to kill a lion and a bear. He faced his future by revisiting his past, and that's what we must do. Don't go to Jericho until you remember Jordan. That's that's first. But secondly, you've got to remember not only what God has already done, you've got to remember whose you are. I'm in verse 2 of Joshua 4. It says, at that time the Lord said to Joshua, make flint knives for yourself and circumcise the sons of Israel again a second time. 600 years earlier, this practice of male circumcision had been inaugurated among the Hebrew people. According to Genesis 17, 1, circumcision, God told Abraham, will be a sign of the covenant between between you and me. Eight days after the birth of every male child, they would be symbolically set apart by having their private parts altered. This act would symbolize that they were a child of the covenant and belong to the commonwealth of Israel. And during their wandering in the wilderness, the Hebrews let the practice lapse. And it's not hard to see why. The act would leave the men convalescing for weeks, their wives, their children, their substance, their material things left unprotected. Enemy nations were watching their every move. It's not logical. It's not sensical. Shouldn't the men remain at maximum strength and virility and potency so that they could fight off any would-be predator? Yet notice in the text that God was not concerned with their might. God was not concerned with their muscles. God was not concerned Concerned with their skill. God was not concerned with their ability. God was concerned that they remember whose they were. Specifically, that God, according to Joshua 5, 9, watch this, have rolled away the reproach of Egypt. That phrase in the Westcott Hoyt manuscripts of the ancient Masoretic Hebrew text was a reference to the oppression, suppression, depression, and repression that they had suffered while being enslaved for over 400 years in Egypt. It was time for them to claim their birthright. And can I suggest you tonight, it's time for us to reclaim ours. Go on, tap somebody, say, get it back tonight, amen. Because circumcision was about identification, but get this, it was also a symbolic separation from their past. Boom, that went right over your head. The act declared that you are about to be more than you've ever been. And that's God's message to us tonight, because in a very real sense, 
every person of faith has been circumcised. That might be news to you, but Paul, that gospel globe trotter, that articulate African, wrote to the Christians in Colossae, in Colossians 2.11, he said, when you came to Christ, he set you free, not by a bodily operation of circumcision, but by a spiritual operation, the baptism of your soul. Christ cut away your old life. Christ has severed you from the power of sin, death, and dysfunction. Your former fears, anxieties, phobias, and trauma have all been severed. You are about to be more than you have ever been. So tonight is a good night to exchange your sorrow for a swagger, to trade your inability for an inheritance because you don't just have a passport, you have a ticket. A, t a passport tells you where you've been, but a ticket says where you're about to go. You ought to start speaking over yourself. I will live and not die because I'm a new creation. No weapon formed against me can prosper because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. It cannot be stated too clearly or too often. You are not the person that you used to be and you are only a fraction of the person that you have the potential to be. See, that's true of us as individuals and it's true of us as a community. And that's why we got to enlarge our theology in the church and not just preach about pie in the sky by and by once you die as you fly we got to start preaching about some sound on the ground by the pound that can be found while we still around because Christ had Oh, y'all ain't hear me tonight. See, your past pain is disempowered. When Christ died, you died. When Christ was buried, you were buried. When Christ rose, you rose with it. You are a brand new you. You ought to claim it. You ought to declare it because it's time for you to walk in it because even when things are over your head, they are still up under his feet. Can I preach a little bit in here tonight? And I'll tell you why. Wait, God never wastes a wound. Y'all got to grab that. In fact, God finds value in what we are willing to throw away. Let, let me help you. One of my sons in the ministry, he's a New Testament scholar, Dr. Larry Ennis. He loves Walmart. And I was questioning him on this. Why is it and how did you come to love Walmart? He said, Pastor, Walmart is my favorite store. I said, why is Walmart your favorite store? He said, it goes back to when I was in college. He said, when I was in college, I didn't have a lot of money. He said, so I used to go to Walmart because it was the cheapest thing going. I said, that can't be the only reason. He said, well, he said, my main reason is that I learned how to use my Walmart bags as freezer bags, reasoning why I pay good money for a glad freezer bag when I'm getting these Walmart bags for free. Catch up, catch up, catch up. Look, he used to buy his chicken wings in the family pack. He'd go back to his dorm room, break them down into about four wings apiece. He'd put them in one of them Walmart bags, wrap them up, put them in the freezer, and they would turn out just right. I said, man, is that the only reason? He said, you don't understand, Pastor. He said, them Walmart bags are a multi-purpose bag. He said, a Walmart bag can be a tote bag, a laundry bag, a gym bag, a lunch bag, an umbrella, and even a purse. And somebody on your road tonight is trying not to feel me, but the devil is a liar because if I go to your house right now, you got a Walmart bag hanging on one of your doorknobs substituting as a trash bag. Go on, tap somebody saying, no need in line in here tonight. See, but wait, 
we keep those bags because intuitively we know that after we buy our groceries and get them home, the bags still have value. And just as you find value in those little bags, so God finds value in you. God finds value in your problems, value in your pain, value in your predicament, value in your pressures. God can get something out of everything and use everything to do anything. God can use what hurts you to heal you. God can use what sets you back to set you up. God can use sorrow to give you a song, a struggle to make you strong. God can use rejection to point you in a new direction if you just remember whose you are. Okay, let me come at it like this. I, I, have, I have five grandchildren. I know, get over your shock. It don't make no sense to look this good and be a granddad. <laughs> I have five grandchildren, and I love them. My prayer for all of you tonight is that God would let you live long enough to have you some grandkids. Kids are great, but grandkids. I figured this thing out too because see grandchildren are the gift that God gives you for not killing your kids. I have five grandchildren and my granddaughter Rachel, she loves to draw. So whenever Papa's home, we've got to draw, we've got to work in her workbooks. And recently we were working together in one of her workbooks and I looked down and I noticed that all of her lines were crooked. Now, you can't just drop that on a kid. You'll crush their confidence. They won't even want to draw no more. So I had to figure out how to ease up to the situation. So I said, Ray, this is good. I said, this is real good. I said, but baby, have you noticed that your lines are a little crooked? And that little girl pushed back from the table and said, Papa, I'm doing the best I can. I said, okay, baby, don't get upset. I said, let me introduce you to something. I said, do you see this right here? She said, yeah. I said, this is called a ruler. She said, okay. I said, do you know what it's for? She said, not really. I said, well, do you see how your lines are crooked? That's because you are trying to produce them all by yourself. You need a ruler because a ruler will help you keep your stuff straight. Come here, somebody. Don't you live another crooked year trying to do it all by yourself. You need a ruler, and I've got a recommendation for you. His name is Jesus Christ. Is there anybody here tonight who can testify that if you get him in the picture, he will straighten your stuff out? Tap somebody, say, yes, he will. See, the secret to moving ahead, you got to remember what God has done. Remember who you are. But look, thirdly, you got to remember where you are. Everybody shout, where you are. Wait. And where were they? Look, this shout is so quick, it's going to go right over your head. You're going to miss it. You won't even be able to shout about it. It's so quick. Remember where you are. Where were they? Here it is, almost there. I told you it was going to miss it. Amen. Went right over here. Let me say it again. Where were they? Almost there. Don't fall apart when you're almost there. Don't quit when you're almost there. Don't surrender when you're almost there. The fight will be the hardest when you're almost there. The struggle will be most difficult when you're almost there. You may get knocked down, but get up again because you're almost there. It might appear that everybody around you is being blessed before you, but remember, if God is blessing your neighbor, it's because God is in the neighborhood and it's only a matter of time before he gets to your house. You are almost there. 
The Hebrews did what God commanded and God protected them. Devotion prompted divine protection. Don't face the enemy this year by facing the enemies. Face the enemy by focusing on God. Remember what God has already done. Remember who you are. Remember where you are. And then remember for whom you work. Regardless of the name of your place of vocation, if you are a child of God, you may be working there, but you are not working for them. You work for the Lord. Let me try and help you. Stephen Carter, one of my friends who leads the Mount Ararat Church in Brooklyn, New York, shared with me an experience of getting on the elevator to go and see one of his critically ill members at the Harlem Hospital. Now, Stephen is single. I don't know if he loved to mingle, but he is single. He's a single pastor, and he got on the elevator, and the elevator door is open, and he said, there stood this gorgeous woman in medical scrubs. I, did I tell you he was single? I, did, did I say, I don't know if he likes to mingle, but there was this gorgeous woman in medical scrubs and she got on the elevator. They were on the elevator alone, so he struck up a conversation with her. When she got on the elevator, he said, how are you? She said, fine, how are you? He said, good. He said, who are you and what do you do? She said, I am a cardiologist. That piqued his interest because did I tell you he was single? I, I, I don't know if he loved to mingle. She said, I am a cardiologist. But then she added, however, I'm no ordinary cardiologist. That piqued his interest. She said, I'm the one they call when all the other cardiologists have failed. Then she flipped the script on him and said, who are you and who do you work for? He said, I'm a pastor and I work for the one they call when you fail. <laughs> Have a good night, church. May the Lord bless you real good. But when your doctor fails, when your mother fails, when your money fails, when your health fails, when your money runs out, you've got somebody who will never fail. Can I say it like I feel? Ain't he all right? Ma, 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 ma. That church say amen. 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 Ain't he all right? <laughs> Oh, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. We must not forget where we come from. We must not forget what the Lord has done for us. And what he has done for others, he will do for you. And if he blessed you in the past, he will bless you right now. And he has every intention of blessing you in the future. Let's put our hands together again for Dr. Watson, amen. Thank you, my brother. Woo. Man, I'm telling you, he expounded upon that text. You ought to look at that text in a different light. You ought to look at that. That is what the Word of God is all about. It applies to all of our situations. And he said something I think is very important. He said, God can use your hurt, all right, and turn it into healing. I just think that's so, so very powerful.